Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, you are going to hear the voice of a man who will tell you some tremendously important facts. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I have a very special episode today. We have Rabbi Rami Shapiro, an amazing writer who has really taught me a lot about Judaism, something that's a blind spot for me. And it's and, and uh, the more I read uh, the rabbi's books, I've learned that there's a lot more to it than what we understand in the world that we're in. Rabbi Shapiro has a reputation for perhaps being the most unorthodox rabbi you've ever met. Growing up, his mother thought he might be the Messiah, while his father was convinced he was uh, Luftmensch, uh, airhead. Indeed, he earned r rabbinical um, ordination from Hebrew Union College, order to pre preach his ideas in synagogues, and a PhD in contemporary Judaism from Union Graduate School in order to teach his ideas in universities. Along the way, he's taken Bodhisattva vows in Zen Buddhism, become a 32nd degree Mason in the Scottish Rite, has been initiated into the Ramakrishna order of Vedanta Hinduism, joined the Theosophical Society, published three dozen books. He has had uh, poems included in uh, prayer books and hymns around the English speaking world and has walked the 12 steps of Overeaters Anonymous more times than he can count. An amazing uh, bibliography and an amazing collection of books and writings. And in particular today, after just read, reading uh, Judaism Without Tribalism, um, I have a chance to talk to um, Rabbi Shapiro. And welcome to the Reality Revolution, Rabbi. Thank you. It's always good to be somewhere where reality is the base. Exactly. <laughs> ever so true. So um, it's uh, we've we've tried to schedule this interview. We've had a, a few hiccups, and you know I do think that um, there's always perfect timing. Um, you know, in, if, we, if as I've been following the news and reading about what Kanye West has said, and um, there's you know been discussion of anti-Semitism and Judaism. Um, I think there's a lot of distortion in what I'm reading, and it's great to have you on and sort of discuss these issues. You've written an amazing book, Judaism Without Tribalism, with the central tenet being what we understand of as the Jew and our understanding of Judaism um, uh, should be changed. It's not a tribal thing. Um, and I just I, I found it uplifting and, and helped me to understand a little bit better. What was your intention in writing Judaism Without Tribalism? So I make this distinction between tribe and tribalism. I mean, right. Judaism is a tribal religion. I mean, there were 12 tribes, and then we got, we were down to two. I mean, I belong to the Hebrew tribe, if you can put it that way. And I'm very proud of that. I think it's a, like all tribes, it's unique. I mean, I, I have no trouble or problem with belonging to a tribe. My problem comes with tribalism, when my tribe is better than your tribe, right. when my tribe defines everything there is to know about me, when my tribe becomes a fetish. That's tribalism. Right. Uh, and, and that, I think, is a mistake. So in the book, Judaism Without Tribalism, I imagine what Judaism would be if we didn't make a fetish out of being Jews. And if, when you don't do that, then what's left? What's left, I think, is a radical non-dualist theology, which comes from the Kabbalists, the mystics, that says everything is a manifesting of the divine. I mean, the Hebrew word, there's lots of Hebrew words for God, but the the Hebrew word that's most common for God is the unpronounceable Hebrew mm -hmm. word, which is yud heh vav -Hey in, in Hebrew, or Y-H-V-H -H in English, that most Bibles mistranslate is not even close, but they render it as Lord, which makes the word masculine and hierarchical and male and patriarchal. Mm -hmm. The actual word itself isn't even a noun. It's a verb. It means to happen or to be. God is the happening of all existence. Isn't God isn't a being, even a supreme being. God is being itself. So you and I and everything in the universe and whatever's beyond the universe, we're all happenings of this divine reality. This divine reality doesn't choose one people over another. It doesn't dabble in real estate. It doesn't reward and punish you. It's just existence itself. So the theology becomes universal, uh, which religions, especially in the West, you know, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, 
we don't like universalism all that much. We like a God who picks a side and yeah. then punishes everybody else. So it, it gets rid of all of that. And then it creates a universal ethic that in the Jewish frame really comes down to uh, what Rabbi Hillel in the first century BCE uh, articulated as what's hateful to you, don't do to anybody else. I mean, it's the golden rule, though. Most people who imagine the golden rule or think about the golden rule take Jesus's first century rendition in the positive, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. But the original, which comes from Confucius, is in the negative. And in Judaism, the original Jewish expression comes from Hillel a century earlier. Don't what is hateful to you, don't do to somebody else. I mean, that's the heart of a Judaism without tribalism. And what makes it uniquely Jewish is the traditions and the practices that or, or through which you then live out this, this ethic. So it, it's a matter of interpreting all of, um, I'll give you a concrete example, but all of Jewish tradition according to Hillel's understanding of the golden rule. So, you know, keeping kosher. So the principle behind keeping kosher, the way you eat, there's much more to kosher than diet. But the, one of the principles behind keeping kosher is this notion of minimizing the uh, pain you cause animals. If you're going to eat animals at all, and the Bible suggests you don't, I mean, the original human diet is vegan. But if you're going to eat animals, uh, then you should minimize the suffering you cause them uh, when you slaughter them. That's a beautiful principle. I mean, I don't eat animals, but let's assume you're going to. At least you should minimize the suffering you cause by killing them. Right. But then you get this, you make we make a fetish out of an ancient way of slaughtering animals. So we kill them in a way that imagines we have no we have, that technology hasn't developed over millennia to do it more efficiently and more painlessly than the ancients did it. So we still use a knife and we still turn the animals upside down and we, we torture them, uh, which violates the principle. But a Judaism that without tribalism, that doesn't make a fetish out of tribal um, traditions would say, no, it's, it's Judaism of principle. How do we minimize the suffering of an animal? Well, A, don't eat it. B, if you're going to eat it, at least kill it in a more, and this is stupid, humane way, which is, I mean, it's an oxymoron, but kill it in a more, in a more humane way that, that causes the animal less suffering. So you could still keep kosher, but you do it in a different way. So it's not, you know, I'm not anti-tradition. I'm simply pro-ethic or ethics, pro-morality. And it all comes from the Bible. You don't have to go to, I mean, I, I have been, in, like you said earlier, I've been initiated in, in a lot of different religions. Religion fascinates me. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to go outside of Judaism to find a beautiful way of life. But you do have to get beyond tribalism. Otherwise, you, you end up imitating a lifestyle that is centuries old, if not millennia old, that doesn't really um, perpetuate the principles of Judaism, but simply imitates the practices of an ancient and I would say, thankfully, bygone era, whether we're talking about the way you treat women or the way you treat animals or, you know, the way the way you live in general, if that if that makes sense. Now, how old is Judaism? How far back does it go? Is there a time of non-Judaism? Well, look back at the history of Judaism. When is its beginnings? Three. Well, it's hard to, you know, 3000 years, 4000 years. I mean, it's you know debatable when when it starts, but it's right. thousands and thousands of years old. Um, but it's not it's not static. So the it's Judaism of, of, of Abraham, Abraham and Sarah are the first Jews. Mm -hmm. Their Judaism is very simple, very nomadic. It's very different than the Judaism of Moses, which was also a nomadic Judaism, I would say, mm -hmm. which was very different than the Judaism of the priests, which is now about animal sacrifice. That's the focal point, which is very different than the Judaism of the prophets, which was opposed to animal sacrifice. And it's very different than the Judaism of the rabbis, which is very different than the Judaism of the mystics. So it, it changes over time. And one type of Judaism gets absorbed in another, and you, you can go back and find remnants of the older 
forms in the in the newer forms, but it's not static. And I think we're on, if let me put it this way, I think if Judaism is going to survive, it has to morph into a new form. Not necessarily the form I outline in Judaism without tribalism, but in a new postmodern, post-tribalist form that maybe has yet to emerge. And I think that's true for all religions. I think you have to see a post-tribal uh, Christianity and a post-tribal Islam. And, and I don't think we're seeing it yet. In fact, when you move into a new form, the old form becomes more violent, more threatened, or maybe the other way around, becomes more threatened. It sees itself, it sees its own demise coming and becomes more violent as it tries to protect itself. So you see a more violent form of ethno-Christianity emerging. Same thing, ethno-Judaism emerging, right. uh, eth ethno-Islam. And these are really violent religions uh, that claim to be the true form of, of their religion, but they're really modernist um, reactions to a postmodern transformation that I hope is happening and that they fear is happening. Let's talk about some commonalities, particularly with your background. You've studied Buddhism, Vedanta. There is clearly some commonalities in Judaism with these other religions, some basic concepts that are part of that spiritual tradition that are shared across, um, that, that share some commonalities. Can you share some of that? Yeah, I think you have to look at religion, any religion, at, uh, on two different levels. Mm -hmm. One is the, I will call it the surface level. I, that may be a little slighting. I don't mean to do that, but I can't think of another term. So you look at it from the surface level, the sociological level, the level that that you know Jews wear, Jews keep kosher, and Muslims have halal, right? I mean, they both have dietary rules. They're very similar in, in many ways, but they both have dietary rules, and they're different enough so that one is Jewish and one is is Muslim. So you can look at all those those differences on the surface. The other level is the mystic level. I'm only interested in the mystic level when I'm looking for commonalities. Uh, when you look at the mystics, when you look at the Sufis in Islam, you look at the great Christian mystics over the last 1,500 years, you look at the Kabbalists and the early Hasidim in Judaism, when you look at, um, it's hard to say Hindu-Buddhist mystics because mysticism is so much a part of the mainstream, but you look at, at um, some of the great Tibetan Buddhists, some of the great Zen Buddhists, you look at the Vedantists in, um, in Hinduism, when you look at the mystics in these different traditions, and, and some of them are, are um, from indigenous traditions, it's not just the big brand name religions that are mm -hmm. more, more that you know you read about when you read the read a book, the religions of the world or something. So so in right. Ubuntu in Africa and you know Native American traditions in America. But when you look at the people who go deep into the mysticism, you always find, I think, four basic points. And I I, uh, I call these perennial wisdom. Aldous Huxley wrote a book called Perennial Philosophy. Same point, same idea. There are four basic points that all these traditions share. They're very simple. The first one is everything in the universe is a manifesting of one dynamic happening called by different names. So you can call it Brahman, you can call it Tao, you can call it Mother, you can call it Nature, you can call it Great Spirit, you can call it Dharmakaya, Krishna, Kali, God, Yudheva, I mean, you know, the, the names are endless. Mm -hmm. But from the mystic perspective, there's just one of these things. And the names ultimately don't matter. You have the first line of the Tao Te Ching that says the Tao that can be named isn't the Tao we're talking about, right? Because it's, it's beyond naming. But we have to say something. So in the Rig Veda of the Hindus, uh, you have this phrase, um, uh, truth is one, different people call it by different names. So that's what we're saying here. There's one reality of which everything is a part, and people call it by different names. That's the first of the four points. Second uh, of the four points is you and I and every other human being have an innate capacity to awaken in, with, and as this fundamental reality. 
You don't need a priest. You don't need a rabbi, an imam, a, a guru, a swami. You don't need an intermediary between you and this reality because you are this reality. You may need a teacher to show you a method for preparing for the realization of your own divinity. But there's nothing between you and God because there's nothing other than God, if that makes sense. So you have this innate capacity to awaken. The third point is that when you awaken to divinity, you realize that everything is part of this non-dual reality. You're immediately and inwardly called to treat all reality according to the golden rule, right? You're, you're In the Bible, it's called uh, being a blessing to all the families of the earth, human and otherwise. It's not a command from the outside that some God says, you must do X, Y, and Z. It's that I know that you and I are part of the same system. I know that the plants and the trees and the animals are all, we're all sisters and brothers. We're all parts of the same reality. I can't hurt you. I, it just no longer, I'm no longer capable of doing that. Or to the extent that I'm aware of our shared reality or shared divinity, I'm no longer capable of that. And then the fourth point is awakening to this ultimate reality and being a blessing comprise the true purpose of being human. And, that, and that's it. That's what all, I, that's in my experience, that's what all the mystics are saying. And each tradition has its own way of experiencing this and talking about this. But fundamentally, that's what they're saying. It's uh, and, and let, Go let ahead, I'm sorry. Jump in one other thing, because I, I, I'm just cutting you off here. No, but no. Back to the previous thing about what, you know, what's next for religion, in a sense. Where are the world's religions going? And why does this scare the crap out of normative religion at the moment? They're going toward these four points. And what what will be of interest to people who go in that direction won't be what's your theology, because we're going to have the same theology. We're all part of this oneness. What's going to be of interest is how do you awaken? So I awaken, someone will say, through the Jesus prayer, or I awaken through mantra japa, repeating a, a, a sacred word or phrase, or I awaken through, uh, there's a mantra practice in Judaism called haga. But they're all the same mantra is, is mantra repeating a sacred phrase, or I do it through breath work, or I do it through whatever, whatever it might it might be, and we'll be interested in each other's practices, uh, but we won't fight over them because that would be stupid, you know. So I have a Hebrew mantra and you have a Sanskrit mantra. Well, I'm going to kill you because of that. I mean, that would be stupid. Right. So we want to we're curious about one another's practices, but the goal is always the same, and there's nothing divisive in the four points of perennial wisdom. And again, that scares normative religion, tribalist religions, because they want to be, they, they live in a win-lose world. They live in a, in a zero-sum world where only the Southern Baptists go to heaven. Everyone else goes to hell. Right. You know, only the Jews are the chosen. Everyone else is second best. You now only the Muslims are the true believers. Everyone else is an infidel. So, um, or the caste system does the same thing. Only Brahmin caste is the good, is the is the high caste. I mean, all that kind of crap that people have invented over the last thousands of years. All that is wiped out in this new era that I'm hoping is emerging. But anyway, go ahead. Back to your question. No, no, I, you were you were talking about something that I think is super important as something I have found a commonality in exploring all of these different spiritual traditions. Um, is that I am God. And, you know, ye are gods, as it says in Psalms, uh, you know, Jesus is teaching essentially in my own interpretation that we are all Jesus. And so I get the, the same interpretation that what you're saying when Moses asks God in, I think it's Ecclesiastes, I'm not sure, um, what, what should I call you? And he says, I am, you know, or something similar to that. Um, so this this is is profound. And, and, and the system of Judaism is a system of awakening, as you said to our divinity because there's only god so if if i'm god you are god and all of us are the same being a protean being of of, of sorts that i see a commonality even though um there are some people that can say in the old testament um that this you know that this is a sin to say i am god uh, i'd like to talk about that quandary that has been explored throughout the ages 
of claiming your divinity, but then also understanding that maybe I'm, I'm, I'm doing some sort of sin, and that it's wrong for me to claim that I'm God. Yeah, it's only a sin in the West or the Middle Eastern traditions. Okay. Right? Only Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are afraid of that, and only the non-mystics. So it's you're talking about the book of Exodus, not Ecclesiastes, Exodus, but the book of Exodus. Right. Moses says to, to God, you know, so what's your name? And and the first name, God gives two names, but the first name God reveals is Ehia, which most Bibles translate as I am. Uh, it's it's a verb. It's There is no good English, but it's more like I um eyeing i not apostrophe but yeah maybe it is but but i apostrophe ing um it's a verb it's, it's the god is the eyeing of the universe right uh, and you and i are part of that divine eyeing and then maybe realizing that no one <laughs> is going to understand what what that means god then gives the same verb where eyeing is first person singular form of the verb to be in Hebrew, uh, God switches to the third person singular and says, okay, let's try this. So it's more like happening. I am, you know, so God says the, the YHVH, tell him happening sent you. So none of it is really clear. And that's why it's such right. a, a great term to explore from the mystical point of view. But when you awaken as the one in these in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, you don't do well. So, you know, Jesus <laughs> Jesus says, I and the Father are one, and it doesn't go well, right? It doesn't go he's well. Not, he's not crucified for that. He's crucified because there's the notion that he's the, the king of the Jews, and that upsets the Romans, because the, the, the Roman, the Roman king, the Roman Caesar is the king of the Jews and everyone else in the Roman Empire. So it's a, Jesus is a political threat to Rome, and that's why the Rome, Romans crucify him. But um, it doesn't make him popular among the 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 Jewish elite because they're not, for the most part, open to the notion of self-realization, God realization. Mm -hmm. So uh, in in the uh, Islamic world, you have this wonderful Sufi teacher, uh, Al Halaj, who said Al Haq, which means I am truth. Same thing. I am God. I am truth with a capital T. And they killed him for that. And you get uh, later in, I think it's the 11th century, uh, Jewish mystic Abraham Abu Lafia, who said, I am, I am he, I am God. And they ran him out of town. Right. So, you know, in the West, it's dangerous to say that because they, they don't understand the, the I that's speaking. And I'll, I'll tell you a story about that in a sec. But it, yeah. in the East... You know, when when someone says when it, when a a Hindu has that awakening and says, um, you know, Ham Brasmani, I am the divine, they go, Congratulations, <laughs> you know, you've been working on this and now you got it. Okay, good work. You know, it's a totally different thing. Atman is Brahman. They understand that there. Right. But I'll I'll tell you a story if you've got a, a minute Please. or two for this. I was leading an interfaith group in um, Israel, Palestine, and we were in Nazareth, uh, no, in Jerusalem at what's called the Garden Tomb. So Christians fight over where Ju uh, Jesus was buried. Mm -hmm. Catholics, Armenians, Orthodox Christians of various sorts believe that he's buried in the church, what, what's now the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And they fight over the church itself and is divided up into different segments where different denominations have their have control <clears throat> but protestants led by the anglican church believe that he's buried outside the walls of jerusalem in this place called the garden tomb and you can go visit as a tourist or you know as anyone you can go visit it's a beautiful place i recommend it and it's run by the anglican church only anglican certified guides can give you a tour so I took this interfaith group I was leading and we went there because it's so cool. And you can actually go into the tombs. It, it is a cemetery. Right. And you can go into the, the tombs and it looks like just what's described in the Bible. And our guide, uh, our the guide that was taking us through the country wasn't allowed to have any part of this. The Anglican guide was the only guy who, who was allowed to take us around. And he was very 
anti-Muslim and he, he didn't get the interfaith idea. And he was really, he was an awful person. Right. And I couldn't stand being, I couldn't listen to him. And I kept interrupting him and trying to push back on what he was saying, which was so, it was just Islamophobic. It was terrible. But eventually I realized I was ruining everyone's experience. So I just said, look, don't pay attention to what he's saying. Just experience the place. And I walked away. And I went to meditate in the garden by myself. And I'm sitting cross-legged on a bench and I'm meditating with my eyes closed. And then I hear this voice. It's a woman's voice. And she says, are you the rabbi? And in the Jewish tradition, when you hear a woman's voice, it's called a bat kol, which means mm -hmm. the woman's voice, the daughter's voice. And it's what God's voice is supposed to sound like. This is in the ancient rabbinic literature. God sounds like a woman. Oh, okay. So you hear God calling. So I'm listening and my, my egoic fantasy is God is calling, asking if I am <laughs> the rabbi. Like you said, my mother thought I was the Messiah. So here's God saying, are you the rabbi? And I opened my eyes to see, you know, who was talking to me. And it was an Anglican guide, a, a woman from the church who was, uh, who had heard about my altercation with the guide that was assigned to us. And she wanted to know if that was me. And I said, yeah. So she put to me what's called C.S. Lewis's trilemma. It's something that is in the book of, it's in his book, Mere Christianity, mm -hmm. came out of his radio show that he was broadcasting during the Blitz in World War II in, in London. And in that, his trilemma is, he, that he, this is the trilemma. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, is Jesus lying, is he a lunatic, or is he the Lord? So those, that's, those are your three choices. Is he lying? Is he a lunatic? Or is he the Lord? And she, that's what she put the question. What do you say? And that's the try and the trilemma. Those are your only choices. And, you know, who's going to say that Jesus is a lunatic and he's a liar? So you're stuck with, oh, he must be Lord. I reject the limit of the three possibilities. And I said to her, I don't, I, I reject the premise of the question. I think there's a fourth alternative. And to her credit, she said, a fourth alternative what's that i said he's a god intoxicated jewish mystic and he understood that he is as everyone else is an expression of the divine reality that he is one with god he knew that i don't know if he was unique in his in his time but he definitely knew that and that when he said he is the way the truth and the life he's not talking about the egoic jesus He's talking about the I consciousness that is, is who we really are, our truest nature. And she's never heard anything like that before because they weren't teaching mysticism in her church. So she said, I'm, I'm going to think about that. So, you know, maybe I, I corrupted her a little bit with some perennial wisdom mysticism. But that's where religion needs to go. And if if anyone who's listening who is a Christian for whom this is new, read Cynthia Bourgeau, Wisdom Jesus, or read Andrew Harvey's uh, book on, on Son of Man, or The Cosmic Christ with, from um, Matthew Fox. I mean, there's so many different wonderful Christian mystics out there whose books on Jesus bring this Jesus to life uh, and 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 sort of bring him back to the church in, in such a way as to free you from this, the, the patriarchal, egoic Jesus that the church has ex, has built up. This is, sounds terrible, but simply for the exploitation of the followers. And I think every religion does that. It's all yeah. about power. It's all about money. It's all about control. And, it, and tribalist religions, regardless of the brand name, it's they're they're all a danger to to humanity. I would I would love to know if you have read or heard of Neville Goddard, uh, another. I w he's a Christian mystic, but just a mystic. Have you heard of his interpretations? No. no. So I'm so excited. This I think you'll find as somebody that seeks out knowledge, um, a revelation from his material. So Neville Goddard Give us, uh, has just taught spell his me, name. Neville N E V I L L E. And Goddard, G O D D A R D. Um, he was a uh, a mystic that taught mostly 
from around the 40s through the late 60s into 19, I think he died in 1972. Uh, and he explained that everything in the Bible is true. It's spiritual history. It's not, none of it is true history that, that, that each of the characters in the Old Testament and New are, are states that we go through. And that Jesus, we are all Jesus Christ, and it's the final state. Uh, you know, John the Baptist is the state before John. You know, he he is trying to be perfect, and then loses his head, and then you have Jesus Christ. Um, the the primary thing is he's going through emphasizing all these teachings, it, claiming that he had an experience, experiencing the promise in in the Bible that he became that he was Jesus Christ as we all are, and that he experienced this and taught it. Um, I just, you know, find it resonates the, the the secondary interpretation of the Bible is not really worried about the historical aspects, if it's historically true, but that it's spiritually historic, that it's talking about there's a state of Abraham, there's a state, um, each of these are states, and they're describing it on another level, it's a spiritual level, and I have a better, a different understanding of this material. It's talking to another part of me, not about what happened, but what is what is happening within me. Does that, has that make sense? Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, it, that kind of interpretation goes back, you know, a couple thousand years to Philo. Right. Um, so, so that's not new. One of the things right. that I, I would, I don't know what the, what the one board I'm looking for is, but one of the things that, that, that I would, be concerned about is it erases the history of my people so right. you know to i'm say not that saying Moses, it's not historical i'm saying that, that but if he's going to say that abraham level. is a state and not a right i mean i don't know if abraham was a historical person but right he, it erases jewish history i mean certainly david was historical solomon is historical the kings were historical right. so I, I think you have to be careful that in, a, in an attempt to spiritualize the entire bible you you do tremendous damage to the actual history of the Jews that you find in the Hebrew Bible, but also right point. into, you know, into the Jewish Bible. I mean, Roman occupied Jewish Palestine is not a state. It was a brutal occupation right. in, in which Jew, uh, Jews were, were slaughtered, were crucified by the tens of thousands and Jesus was, was among them. So I think we have to be careful. I agree with um, that. So, you know, it could be a secondary meaning. This happened. Um, but if you get caught up in the his historicity of it, the exact nature of it, um, this, this, th these people from our history were mentioned because they represent a, a spiritual idea. Does that make more sense? We know that Abraham existed, but we also know that Abraham also was a certain spiritual state that, that it was reflected by what he experienced. Not yeah, denying I, I don't, what I don't doubt that either. Again, the only thing I guess I'm thinking about Jesus for a second and so yeah, Jesus is, like I said, a God-intoxicated Jewish mystic, but he's also a radical prophetic character who stood up against Rome. And mm -hmm. we live in a time when, you know, figuratively speaking, the fascistic elements of Rome are, are staring us in the face, are, are threatening our very existence uh, as, as, you know, free people. And we want to be able, I, I'm, one of my fears is that we are going to allow fascism to arise and we're going to take refuge in a faux spirituality that just says, oh, this world doesn't matter. It's not real. I'll let them do whatever they want politically, economically, you know, socially, and I'm just going to hide out in, in my spiritual domain. And especially when men say that. You know, because mm -hmm. men can maybe get away with that, whereas women less so. You know, Jesus stood up to the Roman, um, to the Roman oppressor, and he did so in a in a nonviolent way, but a very powerful way. And I don't, I don't want I, mysticism is crucial to our time, but it has to be a prophetic mysticism, right. one that is willing to to go to the cross if necessary. To to challenge the what Paul called the powers um, that are that are threatening our our freedom. I think we live in a very dangerous time, and religion can be a you know a, 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 an escapist. I, I think religion can be fuel for the fascists for fascism, 
And then also a place of escape for those who just say, well, I got to get out of here. So I'm going to just hide out in some mystical fairyland and not deal with the reality. So it's, I don't know. I'm, I don't mean to pick on this guy. I'm going to go look him up. It sounds interesting. No, no. Uh, but, I am not describing him uh, properly. I'm just in context with what you're saying. Um, it's an idea that has helped me to look back on the Bible when I question did, did Noah's Ark really happen? But then I understand that there there's symbology to the story of Noah's Ark, that there are levels. Yeah, some of the, the stuff is parables. It's parables, yeah. right? Right. To the argue book of Job animals... is one of my favorite books. Once I understood that it was sim that it was telling me right. more than a, some historical event that happened yeah. to Job. Yeah, you have to know, you have to be able to separate the parable and the metaphor from the history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Job makes no sense if it's history. Right. I mean, that that God makes no sense. And and Noah's Ark would be silly if it were history. You know, then then you go to Kentucky and you look at the Noah's Ark <laughs> Museum right. and you go, come on. Right. Yeah. No, I, 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 I agree with that. So, yeah. And there's a part of me that that refused to read that stuff. And it has helped me come back to it. Uh, and I'm not and I'm not personally saying I'm denying. I'm just saying that that was his perspective. So, um, yeah. Um, the the bible you know they refers to israel often and, and back then there was no israel israel was sort of symbolic of a promised land a place that we were going to uh can you explain how how i interpret that because oftentimes when people are reading the bible they're not remembering that israel had not had formed yet it was a sim symbology to israel well it depends i mean there are the israelite people who were the children of right. israel the guy um then there the, there was the the tribes um mm -hmm. so you know the 10 tribes of of Israel and Judea and all that so so i mean there was a place called Israel that is in the bible uh okay then when when the romans kick everybody out then israel becomes um yeah like uh you know a hoped for return whether it's a spiritual return or actual physical return, I guess you could debate. Some Jews said one thing, some Jews said another. Right. But mostly in the Bible, the Bible isn't, um, the Bible is pretty concrete. You know, mm -hmm. it's not about some metaphysical salvific thing. That That's a much later kind of thing. I think, I think a lot of what you're, you're talking about, I think, is a later Christian gloss. Christianity mm -hmm. is built on a concrete Jewish promise. Jesus, as a Jew, said, I'm coming back in your lifetime. And then he didn't. And then people said, oh, he's coming back in the lifetime of X. And then he didn't. And then he's going to come back in the lifetime of Y. And then he didn't. And then, you know, in, in our time, people are always, going, oh, no, April 23rd, 1847. Right. And then he didn't. So... The, the the notion that this is a concrete thing doesn't work so then eventually no he's going to come back you know the 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 promise is in some celestial jerusalem some off world kind of place and and that's the only way you can make the religion work i mean one of the problems that judaism has is that it's so this worldly you know mm -hmm. judaism is based is very old and in a sense very primitive in that it says you know if you do x you know if you take care of the orphan if you take care of the widow if you treat your your neighbor and the stranger lovingly and justly god will do why you'll have there'll be no famine there'll be rain in the proper season you'll have a lot of kids you'll grow old you know all those kinds of things and then people do what they're supposed to do and there's famine, and there, there's death, and there's pogroms, and there's all these horrible things culminating in the death of six million at the hands of the Nazis. And people are going, wait a second. I mean, when you look to see who most of the Jews were who died at, in, in the Holocaust, they were Orthodox believing Jews. They were practicing Jews. They were doing everything that, that they were supposed to do, and they still got gassed mm -hmm. or shot, right? So, so what's what's going on? So when you have a religion that says the reward is in your lifetime, it doesn't work because the universe isn't structured that way. So Christianity avoids that eventually by saying, no, it's in another world. It's in another place. It's in, it's in, you know, um, heaven. You're going to, you're going to get there when you die. And 
other than Jesus, no one's ever come back to say, hey, it was a scam. Right. I died. I went and it was a Walmart. It wasn't what I expected. I, you know, I thought it was going to be Saks Fifth Avenue and it was just a Walmart. No, no disrespect to Walmart, but you get, you get the idea. I get what, yeah. Can, can it be that, that, that the Old Testament is historical talking and, 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 and bringing out the historicity of what happened with the metaphor, but the, the New Testament is entirely symbolic of what's within the mistake that maybe we make in interpreting it is that, um, Christ's return is from within when we awaken, as we talked about, to our divinity. It's not about him coming from some other place, that heaven, the kingdom of heaven is within. As Paul says, Christ is within. And Paul is making the argument that this is not something that happened. Paul is making something that happens within, it just as, and, I, and I'm not a scholar of this stuff. So I ask, you're the person, perfect person to ask of your interpretation to that yeah, idea that I, book... I think it's I think it's a bit of both. I think that that the church thought Jesus was coming back, literally coming back, and right. that and then he didn't. Um, but yeah, then then you get these statements that I mean, both in the canonical gospels, um, the kingdom of God is within you, but also in the in the like the Gospel of Thomas which is a brilliant collection of teachings Absolutely. of Jesus that that some of which are paralleled in the uh in the in the canonical gospels some of which are are not um but it's a brilliant collection of i don't know you could say wisdom teachings or mystical sayings it mm -hmm. sounds more buddhist than it does christian because it's not about believing you know well Jesus never says, believe in me, but it's not about Jesus so much as about his interpretation of reality. And, you know, one of the things, there, there's a guy, oh, his name just went out of my head, a wonderful uh, New Testament scholar who writes a lot about the Gnostic Gospels. Mm -hmm. Oh, isn't that terrible? Uh, that's what happens when you're in your it'll come, When you read so much, it'll come back for sure. Yeah, maybe it'll come back to me. But <laughs> but someone asked him once in a in a video, why the gospel of thomas isn't included in the, in the in the canon of the new testament even though it was written around the same time as the gospel of john and his response was you can't build a church on the gospel of thomas you know in in the in the other gospels there's clear leadership in the opening lines of the gospel of thomas jesus says Anyone who can figure out what I'm saying, I'm paraphrasing, but anyone who can figure out what I'm saying will not taste death. Now, clearly, right. you shouldn't take that literally. It doesn't mean you're not going to die. It means that you're going to shift in consciousness from the egoic to the cosmic. You're going to realize that I am the father of one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to move from that egoic Jesus to the cosmic Christ consciousness. But the way to get there is to read the 100, what is it, 101, 103 uh, teachings of Jesus in that book, and to crack them like you crack a Zen koan. Mm -hmm. There, if you can figure out what I'm teaching you, Jesus says, your consciousness will shift, and you'll, be, you'll realize your oneness with God. And while your ego will die, your greater self is, is divine, and, and it won't die. Um, so the apocalypse you know, is, is the apocalypse of the ego. The yeah, revelation right. in the churches can be like the shock. It's when you read Revelation after meditating and awakening, you can see it's an internal you, you, the 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 ego, the beast is you, right? And and um the beast is dead and the ego is there's an apocalypse of the ego, and there's something that kind of is beyond that. Yeah, apocalypse. I mean tearing down the veil. Right. The the veil of ignorance that that insists, I guess you could say, that you're who you think you are when you look in the mirror you're not right. you know you're this divine happening it's like a wave insisting that it isn't the ocean i mean that's how we live right right it's a good and way what to jesus is saying that you're the ocean recognize it you're your unique manifesting of the ocean but you're the ocean when you die i mean my my mom died a week ago oh i'm so sorry thanks when when she died, my understanding is that when she, uh, you know, breathed her last breath, right? When she when she died, 
she had a realization just before she lost consciousness of her true nature, that she went from being uh, Sally, right, to being the divine and realizing that she'd always been the divine. And her ego slipped off and, you know, the wave returned to the ocean and she was the ocean. I, I was one of my, I won't say it was a friend because that, that would be claiming too much, but one of my dearest teachers Mm -hmm. and mentors was Father Thomas Keating, a Catholic priest, and uh, along with Father Basil Pennington, the founder of Centering Prayer. And I went to visit Father Thomas. I, I met him in 84, and I, I've seen him every year since. So a couple of years ago, he was very sick, and he was dying. And I went to visit him um, a few months before he died. And we're sitting in his monastery in Snowmass, Colorado. He died. He went back to the monastery in Spencer, Massachusetts, where he was the abbot to actually die. But it was with him very near to the end. And we're sitting, he's in a wheelchair. He's a beautiful man, very tall, but he's in a wheelchair. And I said, Father Thomas, how are you dying? You know, I don't mean the cancer. I mean, what? what's your spiritual process? And he said to me, I'm dying the way I lived. And I don't know if I can do this on Zoom, but he's sitting in the wheelchair mm -hmm. and he cups his hands in his lap. So you can't see that anymore, but he cups his hands in his lap and he brings his hands up like this. And he says, throughout my life, Thomas, every time Thomas comes up like the ego, every time the ego comes up, every time the ocean waves Thomas, I let Thomas go. And he just drops his hands into his lap. He does it over and over again. Every time Thomas comes up, I let Thomas go. He just keeps doing this. And he says, at some point, Thomas is going to come up. I'm going to let Thomas go. And Thomas doesn't come back up. And that's death. Whoa. So I said, okay, <laughs> but you're a Catholic priest. Where <laughs> do you think you go? And he just he gave me this look, which I can't. I, I can't do it justice, but he just right. sort of like shook his head like, you, you, you're so stupid. And he said, <laughs> no, you don't get it. Thomas comes up. I let Thomas go. Thomas doesn't come back up because there's no place to go. You're now the thing. Where does the wave go when it goes back to the ocean? It's just the ocean. And that's what I think is true. I think that's true. And and really, I, I, want, I let me retract that. I don't think it's true. On a very, very deep level, I know it's true. Right. When he said it, before he said it, I knew it was true. When he said it, I was convinced it was true, right? Because Not because he said it, just because it's true. Yeah. And uh, being with my mom, I mean, my dad years earlier, uh, there was a sense, and either I'm projecting, it's always possible, either I'm projecting or I'm just in touch with what was happening with them, that they were simply, the wave came up, and then my dad's wave went back and he was the ocean. And my mom's wave came up and it went back down, didn't come back up, and she was the ocean. And that's what's going to happen to to me and to everybody and to everything. And if you can live with that knowledge, which is what Thomas did his whole life, entered the monastery, I think at 16. If you can live with that knowledge that you are a wave of the ocean and continually letting it go, so you're continually reconnecting as the oceanic reality, you live with a tremendous amount of grace and compassion. And I can't do that, but but my experience of him suggests that he could do that, that he was doing that. And that's an amazing way to live. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I'd love to ask you about the Hebrew language, this magical language that seemingly has power it can be turned into numbers and there's so much more when i start reading some amazing authors out there that talk about the hebrew language uh, i i continually am just surprised at how powerful this old ancient language is and how it's just the language itself the symbology of the letters is so transformative can you talk to me about your experience or knowledge of just the hebrew language in general and how by itself it has a certain effect. Yeah, boy, that's that's a huge topic. So there's the shape of the letters themselves, mm -hmm. which 
I mean, there's, I don't know, dozens of books on that. And so each letter with its shape, you can, um, you know, you can visualize each letter and make that a meditation for a lifetime. And, and you constantly get new insights just from the shape of the letter. There's uh, the sound of the letter alone is powerful. There's, uh, and then there's the numerology. I, I personally am drawn to the numerology. Mm -hmm. um, because Hebrew has no numbers like Arabic numerals, Roman numerals, we have no Hebrew numerals. The letters do double duty. So the first letter Aleph is the number one. The second letter Bet is the number two. And they have a way of going through, you know, the entire alphabet. So that means that every word, every Hebrew word, and certainly every word of the Hebrew Bible is um, an, a, a numerical sum, yeah. an, an arithmetic sum. And then the rabbis say, any word that has the same value as any other word can be read, doesn't have to be, but can be read as a synonym. So, for example, the word hateva, uh, meaning uh, nature, the natural world, has the same value as Elohim, meaning God. So if you want to make the case that God and nature, you know, if like you're, if you're a pantheist, God and nature are one and the same, the Hebrew language allows you to do that. The word for serpent, nachash, has mm -hmm. the same number, 358, as the word, uh, that's serpent, 358, as the word Mashiach, Messiah, same number, 358. So when you read about the serpent in the Garden of Eden, you could say it's the Messiah right. who's trying to get them to get to eat from the tree of wisdom, tree of knowledge. Right. What does that do to the story? It changes everything, right? Yeah. So there's all kinds of ways of playing with the, the numbers. I I was once teaching at a synagogue, and, and there, there's a whole commentary. The cool thing about Jewish text now, as opposed to when I was much younger, every cool Jewish text is available in English translation, also French, also Spanish, probably. But right. uh, you can go on Amazon and buy all these things in English. So there's there's a, a Bible translation, five volumes, of all the numerology. You know, you know this is a traditional Kabbalistic book, and uh, it's it's got the Hebrew, and then it's got the original commentary by this guy in the Middle Ages who played with the numbers, and then a modern English saying this is what he's trying to tell you because <laughs> if you don't understand, you know what he was saying himself. And I study all this stuff, and I was teaching it in some synagogue years and years ago. And after I was done, this the rabbi came over to me and he said, you see that old lady over there? He goes, she knows everything about gematria. It's called gematria. She knows everything about this. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting. But in my head, I'm going, nah, that can't be right. <laughs> because she's a woman and an old woman. And women today can study this stuff. But women, women her age were forbidden to learn this stuff. Mm -hmm. So how could she know that? So, but I'm curious. So I went over and I introduced myself and she, cause during the class, she was there, but she didn't say anything. And I, and I said, you know, so I heard that you're, you know, really interested in this stuff. And she told me this wonderful, I won't go into it, it's her whole story, but her dad and her grandparent, her grandfather from the old country, pre Holocaust, mm -hmm. they believed that women should be as well educated as men. And they were totally into the mystical stuff and they taught her the gematria from not toddlerhood, but, you know, young, young age. And for her, I have to think and do the math in my head or with my iPhone, right? She <laughs> had it in her head. You could throw wow. any Hebrew word and she could just, you could hear, you know, calculation to click, 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 click. And she could say, oh, that's the same as blah, blah, blah. And she would do that. And you could do it with words. You could do it with like, take a sentence and take, all the letters in the sentence and find another verse that has the same number or the first letters of, of the words in a sentence and play with those numbers. She had it all in her head Amazing. and could spit it out without any hesitation. And boy, if I, I mean, I would have loved to spend, you know, a couple of years sitting at her feet and just learning a little bit of what she knew. Um, but it but it is out there. Anyone can yeah. get this stuff now. Is um, there a code? 
is there a code with this these numbers it's um, not a code i mean the bible code a- is is a tricky thing that somebody right played up with and sort of a it's it's a way to make money and they come up with whatever they want hitler and you know jfk's right. assassination but that that's that's not a real thing i don't think and and it's been debunked but it's not a code it's just there's 22 letters and and their final forms and it just they all have numerical value all you got to do is if you know make a list here's the letter here's the number go get a hebrew bible and start to, to translate the numbers yeah and then spend hours and hours trying to find other words but you can um the guy's name is Baal, B-A-A-L-H-A, Turim, T-U-R-I-M, Baal Haturim. You can look him up on Amazon. I'll check him out. And get the English translation and see if you can make sense out of it. But, I mean, this stuff is thousands of years old. And it's absolutely fascinating. It is. Is there correspondent correspondent numerical meanings? For instance, we get the 666 or the 144,000. You know, those both add up to nine if we, you know, 18 is one plus eight plus nine. Do those have corresponding meaning, like you said, with the serpent being having similar numbers, or are those just numbers? Can can you can you give yeah. me your there's lots of parallel um number system numerological systems. They right. don't all they don't all jive. They don't they don't have to. I mean, in the Masonic world, you know, you, you mentioned that I was a 32nd degree. That's actually yes. an old biography. I'm a oh. 33rd degree now. I hang out with these with these guys who are enraptured with the numerologies very you know various systems of numerological study and because that's a big big part of Mas- of masonic stuff mm-hmm. and uh and they have different ways of doing it so so they're they don't have to jive but oh, okay. um but the only one that i'm that i'm really i wouldn't even say i'm not a master of any of them but uh, but i the only one i know anything about is is the jewish one uh, and it's it, to me, it is just so fascinating. It really is. Yeah, I can't believe. It. I mean, do you think it's happening while they're writing it? Can you, you you've written your book, right? Can you imagine going through the words of your book and also identifying the numerical the number of the words that you're using? Can you imagine the thought process as a writer to correspond your work numerically like that? Yeah, I don't know if they did that or not. If it was, you know, they wrote what they wrote and someone else saw it. I mean, I, I have right. no idea. But, and it doesn't really matter to me, no. who, you know, where it comes from. But the fact that you can find those correspondences is just, I mean, it just, you know, for thousands of years, Jews have said there are 70, they call them faces of the Bible, the Torah. Mm-hmm. So there's always, there's at least 70 layers of this stuff. And that's a that's not a a literal number. That's a metaphoric number. So, you know, it just means there's layer upon layer upon layer. Because once once you start to unravel the thing, there's really no end to it. It keeps going. It doesn't it, stop, right? It just keep it just keeps going. And as long as it's of interest, I mean, you could just do it for I don't know, just as a pastime. You know, it doesn't go anywhere. But most of the time that that I've been engaged with this material, it's led somewhere to an aha moment that has some practical value. Like, mm-hmm. ah, this this is telling me something about how to live my life or how to engage the world or um and, or or it takes something in the Bible that seems either meaningless and says, no, it's got this tremendous meaning, like the the number of I'm gonna get this wrong. The number of knots, you know, on the Jewish prayer shawl. Let's see if I got my my numbers right. I think there's 26 num not not knots. Uh, the, the the way that the the fringes are tied on the corners of a Jewish prayer shawl add up to 26, mm-hmm. and 26 is the gematria, the numerology of God's name. The YHVH, the Yud Hey Vav Hey, adds up to twenty six, and so you're when you put on the prayer shawl, you're surrounded by four twenty sixes. So you're surrounded by the name of God, but twenty six wow. is twice thirteen, and thirteen is the number of the attributes of um, God, godliness that are laid out in the Jewish tradition, and then thirteen 
um, it's, I, I'm probably losing anyone who's listening. No, please, here, but if you, please. If you no, take the not. word, if you take the word one in Hebrew, which is Aleph Chet Dalid, Aleph is the letter is the number one, Chet is the number eight, Dalid is the number four. If you add up one, eight, and four, you get thirteen. So the oneness of God is expressed through thirteen attributes, and if you double them, you get the name of God. So you're supposed to do these thirteen attributes. Um, for your own sake and then for the sake of the world and that's what god is both for you and the other and it just goes on and on but once you start playing with that it's mind it really shifting. is and it's all based on the math you wouldn't know it just by unless you knew the math yeah unless you knew the math i just want to thank you for inspiring me um to go and look <laughs> to, at this other to learn the math <laughs> to inspire uh, with all of it and, and and being open to talking about some of this stuff. And, and there's a lot that um, just a you know Western guy that grew up in a Christian family. I don't know. And I'm, I'm aware that I don't know. And the, the, the best place I can start is I don't know. I was only raised with the knowledge I have. And the best thing that people can do is, is read books like yours that explain these distinctions and, ex and, and, and go further because there is something there spiritually that we can get it doesn't matter how old it is but we can all learn from it and so thank you for inspiring me no oh, thank you for having me on the show Appreciate so everybody it. needs to read judaism without tribalism there's so much other stuff that we didn't talk about there's some cool concepts that you talk about and i have a better understanding of the word jew and uh, anti-semitism and jew hatred that you talk about uh especially when we hear in the news anti-semitic yeah. stuff coming up um, do you have any comments about that and 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 on our current path toward the way that we re react to anti-Semitism? Is there anything that I can do? Um, anything you know, I can learn or uh, <laughs> in in this process as it's because as as we go through stuff in the media now with the internet, it's like we're learning together as a group and we can it can it can we can learn the wrong things. We can be all distorted or right. uh, we can we can take what what's happened and we can and it can give us a greater understanding of these concepts beyond just the sheer duality of what's yeah, happening it's, now. It's it's tough, you know, just that's a huge topic, but here here's a couple of things I've been thinking about. Number 1, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, anti-Semitism is the world's oldest conspiracy theory, right? It Jews really have been is. behind everything for the last 2,000 plus years. Uh, here's what I would do. One, stop supporting Ye, you know, Kanye. Stop supporting Ye. Stop buying Adidas or Puma because they won't break with him for whatever reason. Um, you know, just look at your language, look at what you support and stop supporting not just anti-Jewish things, but Things that are that are just um, anti-human, things yeah. that are just you know racist and xenophobic, and misogynist and uh, you know Islamophobic as well as anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism is always the point of the spear, but the rest of the 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 head of the spear and the shaft itself, it's every hateful thing that that the fascists like to throw, and we're living in a time where fascism is on the rise and. I don't know how scared I'm supposed to be, but I'm definitely getting more and more scared and concerned. And those of us who love freedom and love liberty and care about uh, human rights should all be on the side opposing anti-Semitism as well as all the rest of it. Thank you. You know, I think Adidas finally got rid of them, but it took them too long. Oh, did they? I didn't hear that. I think today, today is actually the today, but I mean, it took them. You know, well, no, if they did it. They too did too long, it. but I don't. You know, I'm not going to judge but, that. Um, I didn't. Last I heard, they hadn't said a thing. But, uh, but also the thing that's that's somewhat concerning is is how subtle it can be. Um, oh, some yeah. of the anti-Semitists have gotten to the point where they don't say the the words that cause the anger provoke, but clearly from what they're saying by using another person's name instead of um, um, Judaism, you get you get very, very explicit anti-Semitism that doesn't appear enough so that people won't raise their hands and say, I'm not going to buy from that person anymore. That's the thing that concerns right. me now is the subtlety of language being used to express these terms. Uh, we have to open our minds and understand that, you know, that 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 is also happening. Yeah, yeah, it can get very subtle. And 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 you also have to watch the flip side, that everything 
you know, like like everything that challenges is the state of Israel isn't anti-Semitic, right? I mean, anti-Semitic is anti-Jew. Uh, being being an opponent of the way uh, the state of Israel treats the occupied people in the occupied territories that's not anti-Semitic. It's anti-Semitic if you say wipe out the Jews. That's a different thing. Right. But not everything is anti-Semitic. There's enough authentically anti-Semitic stuff, like going uh, death com three on the Jews. Right. I mean that's anti-Semitic. Uh, th there's a lot of authentically anti-Semitic stuff that has to be combated. But if we go too far and say every criticism of everything that a Jew does is anti-Semitism, yeah, that that doesn't help either. So it it it's um, it's sort of tricky, but but it can be done. The thing that concerns me is just 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 the ignorance, you know. Just that's the thing. I you you, you hear these discussions about stuff, and it's such a base level that you just hope that the world can ex educate itself properly and is put in situations where they educate themselves about this stuff you know it's it really takes a lot of compassion and curiosity about the other to see what their life is really like and not to assume that i know what your life is like because i know what my life is like and it just well it doesn't work that way well, thank you, Rabbi. It's, it's been an honor to meet you, and thank you for spending your time with me. Brian, my Ra pleasure. Rabbi Rami Shapiro, Judaism Without Tribalism, among other books, if you go on Amazon. Thank you so much, and welcome to the Reality Revolution. Thank you. We return you now to your local announcement.